Part one. One. You will hear three conversations: the first and the third between two students, and the second between a student and a clerk. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hi, it's Mike, isn't it? Yes, and you're Phoebe. Phoebe, right? Where are you headed? I'm looking for the main hall. So am I. Are you going there to register for next year? Yes, I was told to go to administrations and fill in an application form. That's what I'm about to do. I went to information, and they told me it was at the end of this corridor. Then we have to turn left and immediately right. That should lead us to the exit, where opposite we should find the entrance to ground level main hall. It's a big old red building. From there, we need to go to the first level. And then follow the signs. Apparently, it's the second office opposite the foyer. It would be pretty hard to miss. That sounds easy. It shouldn't be too hard to find. Well, since we're both heading in that direction, let's go together. Hopefully, it won't take too long. I haven't had anything to eat, and I'm starving. Me too. Well, how about I go to the canteen and get us something while you make your way to the main hall? I'm sure there's going to be quite a wait. There always is. I can meet you there. Sounds like a good plan. What do you want me to get you? Um, how about a chicken and salad roll and a drink? Okay. What if they don't have a chicken and salad roll? Anything similar like ham and salad, or just plain salad and cheese. Oh, and don't forget the drink. I feel so dehydrated. No problem. What type of drink? I don't know.、Um, How about a Coke? No, nothing like that. Something healthier. An orange juice? They're usually full of sugar unless you get it freshly squeezed. Water? Yes, that's perfect. Here, take two pounds. That should cover it. If it's more, I'll give it to you when you get back. I only have a twenty, and you know that they get cranky if you give them large notes. Okay. See you in five minutes. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. First year economics. I just have to fill out this form for our records. What's your name? Phoebe Payne. Can you spell that for me? Sure. P H O E B E P A Y N E. Your address? Six. Wainwright Avenue. That's W A I N R I G H T, Nottingham. Nottingham. And your phone number? It's not connected yet. I've just moved in. Okay. When you get your phone connected, contact us. I'll just make a note that your phone number is to be advised. I'll do that. What course were you doing? Law? No, economics. First year. First year economics. Yes, that's right. Okay, take this card across to the economics department and get it stamped, and then you need to come back here to pay your fees. I've made an arrangement to pay in instalments. Do you have any documentation verifying that? Yes, I have a statement from administration. Okay, when you return, we'll have a look at it. Thank you very much. Here you are. It was quicker than I thought, 
but I have to get this card stamped and return here to organise my fees. That's good. It means that I won't have to wait long either. How did you get on? What with? Oh, the food. Well, there wasn't much left, so I got you a cheese and tomato sandwich and water. That's fine. Do I owe you any more? No, I need to give you back three pounds. But I only gave you two. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought you gave me a fiver. OK, so we're square. So what do I have to do? Go to the desk and give your personal details. Then they'll give you a card that you need to take to your faculty. What's your major? Environmental science. OK, so you'll have to take the card to the environmental science faculty and get the card stamped, return to administration in the main hall and organise your fees. And that's it? Yes, that means you're registered. Then we receive a letter with the details of our course where we'll be informed to go to the notice board or online to find out when and where our lectures are. OK. Let's have this bite to eat first. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. A conversation between Mrs. Lamb, a member of the staff in a large hospital, and Andrew, who is a student in the nursing school. Mrs. Lamb is explaining the rules about visiting hours in the hospital. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Hello, Andrew. I believe you want to know about visiting hours. Yes, I do, Mrs Lamb. I have to fill this form out, and I'd like to have some idea why the different parts of the hospital have different times for visiting. I see. Well, let's start with an obvious one. Intensive care. People in intensive care are very sick indeed, and for that reason, we say that visitors can come between 6am and midnight. I can understand that. At the other end of the scale, our maternity patients are usually quite well, but we restrict their visiting hours from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. We find they get very tired if we permit visitors all the time. I see. What about the surgical wards? The doctors prefer to do their rounds early in surgical, so visiting hours are 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Surgical patients are often on very heavy painkillers and they aren't really very good company for their visitors. But surely the visitors come to cheer up the patient, not the other way around. Of course. And often the visitors are able to help the patient a lot. That's why we allow visitors all day, the full 24 hours in the emergency ward. They help comfort the patient while they're waiting to be diagnosed. Of course, it's not just everyone who can visit a sick patient. People in intensive care can only be visited by their immediate family. What's more, we only allow two people in at any time. We let children of the immediate family in to visit people in intensive care, but we don't like to do it. It's very hard on the children, and it may distress the patient. However, if the patient asks for the child and the family agrees, that's OK. What about children in maternity? Of course we let them in. They're very pleased to see their mothers. The rule in maternity is everyone may visit, up to six people at a time. 
The maternity ward is quite sociable, after all. The surgical ward must be different. It is indeed. We don't allow children in the surgical ward because of the danger of infection, and as you know, we restrict the hours. There are a lot of procedures which must be carried out on surgical patients, and we only let two visitors come in at a time. And in emergency, people are allowed to visit all the time. Oh yes, we rely on patients' relatives to be there for them, and we permit everyone to visit the emergency department at all hours. However, we restrict it to three visitors for each patient. Otherwise, the room just gets totally crowded. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Now I have your schedule for the next week's observation sessions. Are you ready? Yes. Where do I start? On Monday, you'll be in male surgical in the morning, and in female surgical in the afternoon. You'll be following Dr. Shea on her rounds. Thank you. And on Tuesday? On Tuesday, you'll be with Dr. Thomas in the morning. And Dr. Robertson in the afternoon. No, that can't be right. You're with Dr. Thomas in the afternoon, and Dr. Robertson in the morning. Do I ever get to see Dr. Kim? Yes, you'll be with Dr. Kim on Thursday and Friday. She'll take you through the children's ward and through our new teenage ward for twelve to fifteen-year-olds. Great. I've read a lot about that new ward. Will I see the schoolroom? Maybe another time. And what will I do on Wednesday? On Wednesday, you'll join the other students for lectures. You'll be in the Redmore lecture room between eight and ten a.m. and later between two and three p.m. Thank you. Do you know how big my class is? The intake this term is two hundred first-year students. I'm pleased to say about one third are men, which is good. Nursing used to be an almost entirely female occupation. I know. My father trained as a nurse, and he was considered very unusual. Is he still working as a nurse? Yes, he's working in a hospital in the country. I guess I just wanted to follow his example. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a discussion between two students and their teacher on a planned charity event. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. So, are you making any progress with your plans for our annual charity event? I guess first things first. Have you decided what charity it will be in aid of this year? We're thinking about help the children in Africa, sir. Well, that's Mark's idea, sir. But I myself prefer a local charity called the Meals on Wheels. 
I'd have to agree with Laura on this one, Mark. After all, we're supposed to be giving back to the local community, and although helping African children is a very worthy cause, it's a little outside our remit. That settles it, I guess. Moving on from the beneficiary question, have you made a decision on what type of event it will be? Yes, we plan on doing something a little different this year. We're calling the event Balloonathon. Basically, we're going to offer balloons for sale to all the students. Balloons? I don't see where you're going with this. Why would they want to buy a balloon? Well, here's the thing. We don't actually give them the balloon. Instead, we'll write their name on it along with the special phone number and then we'll release all the balloons into the air. When they fall to the ground, if a person finds one and rings a special number, then both he and the student who bought the balloon will win a gift voucher. That sounds like an excellent idea, guys. Well thought out. This balloonathon has a real novelty value attached to it, don't you think? Exactly what we said, sir. The only drawback is that the gas you put into the balloons is rather expensive. How much? About £20 per canister, and we'll need about 10 And how many balloons are you planning to blow up? Well, there are over a thousand students in the school, so if even one third of the students buy one, we'd need about 350 balloons. We've decided to order 500 so we don't run out. The good thing is we can return the canisters of gas if we don't use them, and the balloons aren't expensive, so there's no real risk of us spending a lot of money without getting a good return. You two have really thought this one out. I'm impressed. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Thank you, sir. So, how much money do you think we can raise? Well, each balloon costs about 1p, and when it's filled with gas, it's going to cost us about 50 pence. We reckon that if we sell our balloons at a price of £1.50 and we sell all 500 of them, we'll end up making a profit of £1 per balloon. So that's £500 in total. That's fantastic. And it gets better, sir. We've secured a sponsor for our event who's going to give us £1,000. How did you find a sponsor? The balloon company we approached about buying the balloons asked us if we'd be interested in letting them sponsor us too. What's in it for them? They're going to print their logo on every balloon. I think you've done a good deal there. Thank you, sir. So, do we have your approval to confirm our order? Absolutely. But, you know, I think we can sell more balloons if we set our minds to it. So why not order double the amount? A thousand instead of five hundred. We're going to need more than ten canisters of gas, then. Double the amount, presumably. Correct. OK. Let's go for it. Let's make this year's charity event our most successful Ever. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. We're going to hear a talk on wild rice. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good morning. Today we'd like to talk about wild rice. Contrary to what many people believe, wild rice is not rice at all, but a grass. Much of it sold in the world today is not even wild, but rather cultivated varieties that do not occur naturally. Wild rice is really an annual aquatic seed found mostly in the upper freshwater lakes of Canada, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota in North America. Indians gathered wild rice before any explorers set foot on the North American continent. Early explorers were greatly impressed with the strength and hardiness of the woodland Indians, and attributed their vitality to their ample servings of wild rice. Wild rice can grow in water as shallow as three or four feet along marshes and muddy waters. A tall plant, it grows to a height of eight to ten feet, with a long flower cluster. That reminds one of a narrow broom. The grains in their husks on the tall stalk look somewhat like oats. Truly, wild rice is a challenging crop to grow. Even today, it's very susceptible to failure due to weather conditions. If a heavy windstorm comes along just before harvesting, the seeds can be blown into the water, ruining an entire crop. Harvesting at just the right time becomes a matter of beating the birds to it, since wild rice is considered a delicacy by many birds living in the area. Other challenges include insects, disease, poor drainage, and high waters. If the grains are too green, they are difficult to thresh or beat out of their husks. If left on the plant too long, even a few days too long. They fall off the plant into the water. Airboats have brought about recent improvements in commercial harvesting of the wild rice, while newer techniques for parching, winnowing, and hulling have been a help in saving time and labour. Still, it takes about three pounds of grass seed to yield one pound of wild rice. Buyers should be aware of two types of wild rice gathered. And commercial, foraged or hand harvested wild rice is gradually being pushed out of the market by hybrid commercial varieties. Hand harvested wild rice makes up less than twenty percent of the market today. Heirloom varieties of this foraged grain still exist. In fact, it is the only heirloom grain sold commercially. However. Package labels can be deceiving, though the label may read "Indian harvested" or "organic." The product may be hybridized wild rice, placed in freshwater lakes and gathered by Indians in airboats. Hand harvested, organic, and from the Great Lakes region, is the real thing, with superior flavor and aroma, but it may be difficult to find. Though wild rice is one of the most expensive grains, it goes a long way. Some say that one pound of the grain can feed thirty people. To compensate for its high cost, try combining wild rice half and half with brown rice. For a truly colourful presentation, try one third of each: white rice, brown rice, and wild rice. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.